This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Well, I, I guess what I'd like would be questions of clarification during the talk, but like discussion after the talk. Okay. So if something's confusing or I screwed up something or I used a term that Not likely. people Not likely. didn't understand or something like that. And um, as usual, the class goes till 7 tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Lynn twisted my arm. Well, I'm, I'm much more interested in what I'm doing now and what I've been doing for the last few years, um, but I'm still very actively involved in. But uh, Lynn twisted my arm and said there's a lot of people who want to be astronauts in the class, so I ought to talk about that. So this is going to be a real quick run through <coughs> on, on uh, ancient history and then we'll get into um, what I've, I've been doing and what I'm really uh, involved in and interested in and I think you will be as well. So this is just going to be an automatic and um, does the pointer work? Yeah. yeah. All right. Would you like so this is what I um, this is how I got interested in space uh, through Collier's magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, but uh, early uh, space things, and that was my crew on Apollo 9. I came into the program in the third group in 1969. We just saw the command and service module. That's the lunar module. This is some testing that I did on the backpack that I used outside the spacecraft. It was the first time that we've flown the lunar module, which is up here at the second flight of the Saturn V. And here I am outside with that backpack on. A picture I took of my crewman, Dave Scott. Too fast, too fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I can, I don't know if I can uh, do it manually or not. Um, let me see. Get the impression you've told this story before. Animations. Well, I, <laughs> I I tried to set it. Uh, let me let me take it up to about six or seven seconds. So that's the second flight of the Saturn V, and uh, this is the front of the lunar module. Uh, <laughs> and that's a picture I took of the <laughs> module. There I am. That's a picture McDivitt took of me looking out through the window. Anytime you see a command service module in Earth orbit like that, it was Apollo 9 because after that we went out to the moon. Same thing with the lunar module. Uh, if it's over Earth orbit, it's Apollo 9 because it's the only time the lunar module flew in, in the Earth orbit. That was after we came back up for the rendezvous. This looking down on a thunderstorm. This is the, the sightseeing portion of the trip after we got the technology stuff done. The Straits of Gibraltar, coming home after 10 days, asking permission to get on the ship. And then I, this is Skylab, which I also worked on, and I, I have a few slides just to remind people of the current program, the space station, of course, building up from years ago when it was just a couple of modules. And, uh, now it looks something like that, a little bit further than that, but we're going to put the other solar array out in the end soon. One of the Canadian uh, uh, robots, uh, this is a recent comet, and this is the stuff I'm interested in now, which came out of actually astrobiology and impacts being so critical in the development of life on Earth. No, I think we better slow it way down. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the end, anyway. Oh, okay. This is the introduction. <laughs> So I'm, uh, I'm about to go into things which, uh, uh, you know, I'll take it a good bit slower clip. Yeah? What's it like to get sick in space? <laughs> I mean, what, what? What's it like to get sick What's in it space? like? It's a lot like getting sick anywhere. Well, that's not quite true. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me say, from the physiological point of view, it's, it's like getting sick on a, on a boat or in an airplane or if you get car sick or whatever. I mean, barfing is barfing. Uh, it's all motion disturbance, inner ear stuff. So all of that kind of thing is pretty similar. Um, you know, if you get into causation, it's uh, all of it relates to confusion in the inner ear or between the inner ear and the brain when you're getting mixed signals. And in the space environment, the mixed signal you're getting is not so much unusual motion, which it is in like seasickness, but rather it's 
confusion between the two fundamental functions of the inner ear. Um, and I don't know whether you guys have studied this stuff or not, no. but no, okay, so there are two uh, basic sensors in your inner ear. One is called the otolith and the other is semicircular canals. The semicircular canals are like, um, well, it's exactly what they are. It's three orthogonally oriented um, uh, tubes, uh, circular or semicircular tubes with a bunch of little hairs in them. And when you turn your head, um, the, the liquid in those tubes tends to stay still. You're moving the hairs because you're tilting your head. They're hardwired there. And so those little hairs dis get disturbed by the liquid um, and they tell you you're tilting your head up or down or you know, sideways, whatever. Um, the other set of, uh, the other instrument is the otolith. And the otolith, you, the easiest way to picture it is uh, hair is growing vertically with uh, little lead balls on the end of them. And um, if you tilt your head sideways, you can picture those little hairs over here and those, the lead balls on the end tend to bend the, the hair down. So uh, you can tell where local gravity is. Uh, the, the otolith serves the function of saying, well, I'm laying on my side or I'm laying on my back or whatever. Um, so it's a linear acceleration function or sensor. Now, what happens in space is the, the, the semicircular canals still work. I mean, nothing's different there, really. Uh, you move your head, the, the liquid uh, tends to stay still, the hair is uh, move through it, uh, you get the same signal. But unlike on the ground, when you tilt your head sideways, gravity is still saying it's over there now. I do that, it's over there. <laughs> That's over there. So there's this mixed signal between, wait a minute, I rotated my head 90 degrees, but gravity didn't change. It's still down. Um, and that creates a, a, a mixed signal, a confusion uh, with the programming that's been in there. Uh, the result of which, for no reason that anybody that I've ever heard of understands, you barf. I mean, <laughs> Think about it for a minute. What the hell is the survival value of barfing? <laughs> but, you know, when, you, when you're in a funny motion environment. I mean, I, I, you guys are studying biology or whatever, so come up with it. Maybe you got an answer to that, but I've never gotten a good answer as to why barfing is a survival, you know, an evolutionary development. Uh, you got an answer? Yeah, couldn't Great. it be that something that you eat, that something that was common at the time that people would eat, uh, set off this reaction? That made well, why is some why does something you eat set up a motion disturbance? But maybe it's just a uh, triggering the things for motion disturbance without there being motion disturbance. <laughs> <laughs> Work on that theory. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so far, I still don't have a good answer as to what, what the uh, origin of barfing is. But anyway, you do. Now, uh, you know, all of that is kind of fun and interesting and somewhat academic. The reality is, in weightlessness, barfing is different. It's different because everything floats. And um, not only does everything float, but sticky things that float don't go anywhere, okay? So getting the barf away from your face is not fun. And if you're inside a spacesuit and about to, and, and depressurized, you can't get to your mouth. If you barf in a spacesuit in an EVA, you die, okay? Barf equals dead. So, Barfing in a spacesuit is not something you fool around with. And on our third day, fourth day on Apollo 9, when I was checking out the lunar module and barfed two times, one getting the suit on, and then later in the afternoon, the next day I was going to go out on an EVA, which was very critical to the whole development and getting uh, to the moon by the end of the decade, etc., the Kennedy goal. and. Uh, you know, McDivitt and I are standing there, me with a barf bag in my hand, and uh, 
you know, folded it up and put it away, and the answer is we're going to have to cancel the EVA, right? Uh, so uh, that was not a pleasant evening to spend that night when the question is not only are, did we cancel the EVA and maybe that's going to extend the whole Apollo series beyond the end of the decade kind of thing, um, but in addition to that, is it going to get worse and are we going to have to come home, abort the mission and the <coughs> rendezvous and everything else, which is that much more of a problem if we don't get that done. So the next day, as we're working up, and we decided to work up to the EVA, which I went out on, uh, but that had been canceled. So we're going to work right up to the point where we depressurize the hatch so that we go through all the checklist stuff, and then, you know, break, break, pretend I went out, pretend I came back in, close the hatch, repressurize, and then we would pick up the checklist again to make sure that all the procedures were worked out right. And about a half an hour before we got to that point where we uh, would have opened the hatch, um, it was obvious to me that I was feeling a lot better. And McDivitt, we just took a break for a minute, and he said, you look like you're feeling a lot better today. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't we go a little further and see what it looks like. We went down to about 10 minutes before the hatch was going to open, and we were just going to pretend to do that. And he said, how are you feeling? I said, I think I'm doing pretty well. And he said, you look pretty good. He said, why don't we do it? Right. So we did. But, uh, and I didn't die. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, thanks for asking. <laughs> okay, uh, any, so other questions about the astro thing? Yeah. Um, once you adjust to being in space, when you land, do you have to readjust? Or is that much oh, yeah. Yeah, you, um, different, different people, uh, again, one of the things that we don't really have any decent sense of is the causative factors for adaptation in, in weightlessness. Um, there are some interesting theories there after my flight on Apollo 9 because I got sick, acknowledged it. I mean, Frank Borman got sick on Apollo 8, and bless his pointed head, he refused to take any tests or anything, blamed it on the sleeping pill, said it was an allergic reaction, refused to take any tests to verify it, and, you know, uh, the old macho game. Uh, so when we came down on Apollo 9, uh, you know, it was very clear to me that we didn't understand this, Nobody really understood it. We didn't really know whether if that happened. Now it had happened two flights in a row. In the American program, we had almost nobody get sick up until that time. Uh, so this was pretty mysterious at the time. And, and uh, one of the big questions is if you're going out to the moon and somebody is barfing their guts out, you know, what do you do? Did you just ruin a lunar mission? Uh, you know, spend a hell of a lot of money and end up coming home without doing the mission, or what do you do? So I volunteered um, to be a guinea pig for motion sickness research. That's pretty sickening. And I'll tell you, I went through every uh, crazy test you can imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's no fun uh, to be perfectly frank about it. I don't think we learned a hell of a lot. Uh, there were, as I said, without getting into a lot of the detail, uh, there were some pretty weak correlations. I don't even know if anybody's done anything further with it, frankly. I, I'm, I'm not enough interested in motion sickness to have kept pursuing it. Um, but uh, it appeared as though um, I was in the, I don't know, two and a half, three sigma high category for uh, what inherent uh, um, orientation sensing? You know, uh, in other words, you close your eyes, walk a rail. I could walk the rail further than most people. So, having a strong sense of balance appeared to have a negative correlation with motion sickness, or having a strong sense of balance had a positive correlation with motion sickness. Put it that way. Um, 
which is a little bit counterintuitive until you think about it a bit, and then you say, well, I'm, yeah, you can picture why that would be. And in fact, the people who love uh, the vomit comet, you know, the airplane that does the zero-g maneuvers, uh, the people who love it are labyrinthine defectives. People who don't have a connection between their semicircular canals and otolith and their brain. Labyrinthine defective people have a ball. They float around, they can do somersaults, they don't get sick, they don't get malaise, they just have a grand old time. Now on the other hand, you put them here in a dark room at night, and unless they got their hand on a wall, they'll fall over. Because <laughs> they depend on their visual to be able to compensate for the lack of, of uh, inner ear. So, um, you know, you can see a little bit of, of uh, logic in that uh, anti-correlation thing with with balance, but we, we really don't know. Uh, yeah? How does it work when uh, the lunar module links back up with the, the command module, and how tricky of a maneuver is that? It works well, and it's not tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, you know, I don't know how to tell you. I mean, it, you know, uh, let me put it this way. If you're, if you're, if you're going to do the whole operation from the lunar module, then it's tricky. Uh, but we didn't do that. We, we fly up sort of face to face, but when you're face to face, in a way, I mean, in terms of the astronauts, right? Um, in the lunar module, you're standing here side by side, but the docking tunnel is up behind you. In the command module, Dave Scott is sitting there, and the, and the probe for the tunnel is straight in front of you. So clearly the, the lunar module has to pitch over 90 degrees so that the tunnel is aligned. But then when you pitch over 90 degrees, you've got to be looking at the top. Okay, so now when you're flying with a set of controls, which is oriented for, you know, the, way, the direction you're normally looking, but now you're looking at the top, all of your cr controls are crossed. So flying a precise... Um, uh, maneuver out the top as you're very carefully docking is not an easy thing to do. But we didn't worry about it because what we did was, well, except on our mission where we, I think we did it flew it. Yeah, I think he did it from our mission, but it, we did it as a test. After that, uh, you know, the lunar module comes up, you pitch 90 degrees and roll to get the right orientation. And then the guy in the command module just drives straight ahead and makes a docking. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's very simple. Um, the, the problem is not the control. The problem is that you're rotating the axis when you look 90 degrees, when, you, when you're looking straight up. You know, you, you want to close, but instead of pushing the, the translation controller as you normally would to, to move ahead, you've got to move it up. Um, and that's hard to remember when you're doing that. So that, that was uh, not easy for the lunar module commander, or the lunar module pilot to, to handle. But just let the command line do that. Yeah. What was going through your mind uh, the first time you were in space? Like, with the moment you, you left the Earth, I guess. I don't, I don't know. You know, you're asking me a question uh, to remember something very specific about what I had going through my mind uh, back before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> I mean, I can make up a story. I can tell you, you know, I can make up things. I'm sure I was thinking about it. I'm like, can I tell you any more subjectively what I felt? No. I mean, you know, you think of, yeah, I mean, you look out the window, the first thing, the earth is beautiful. It's fantastic. It's a great, you know, it's a great first scene when, the, when you get to look out the window. You know, but the, the, the things that are memorable from uh, spaceflight, whether then or today, are weightlessness, which, you know, is a unique experience. And it's, I mean, aside from the barfing, you know, in that short period of time when you're adapting to weightlessness, and even then, even then, frankly, even though you may be feeling sick, moving around in weightlessness is great fun. It's amazing. It's just a ball. Uh, so weightlessness is, is really a unique experience, um, and you adapt to it uh, even, at least as far as I know, in the worst case, just in a matter of a couple or three days. Uh, the one thing we did learn from the tests I took was 
the, a, a more optimal way to adapt. I mean, because of Borman doing no tests or anything, um, my assumption, because we knew that motion, head motions would aggravate it. So, you know, logic, right? I'm an MIT guy. Hold your head still, dummy. Right. So I go up there for the first two days. I didn't have to do much. You know, mainly McDivitt and Scott were doing it. And I, my day came when we activated the lunar module. So I basically kept my head still for a couple of days. Well, what we learned afterward is that's a great way not to adapt. You know, you just slow down your adaptation. What you want to do is move your head just short of the point where you do get overtly sick. And at that edge, like a lot of chaotic <coughs> systems, you know, when you're near the edge uh, is when you're getting their most rapid learning. And that's the way in which you adapt the most uh, rapidly. But of course, I didn't know that, so I simply postponed until the worst possible time my <laughs> adaptation. Thank you, Frank. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Do you guys really eat all that dehydrated food stuff that they sell in the museum? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering if it's No, the stuff in museums is better. <laughs> Even now, it's better. <laughs> no, a, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that you see is space food is, you know, somebody's pure invention of what space food is like or something. But, you know, yeah, I mean, freeze-dried, if you, if you go to a camping store and, you know, you get freeze-dried food, I mean, that's, that's a, a lot of what we ate on Apollo was similar to that. I mean, you know, it had to be, uh, I mean, you know, if you, get, if you get into it, what you realize is uh, when, you, when you go back and look at Apollo or something like that, you, you select your food, your menu. I mean, there's a big menu and, you know, things you like and you don't like, and so you make up a menu. It has to be within a whole bunch of constraints on every, uh, you know, nutrient, uh, calcium, you know, phosphorus, potassium, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to fall within certain categories. Um, but you make up a menu and you do that probably uh, a year before you fly. Uh, the food was probably manufactured a year before that. <laughs> you know, so they pull it off the shelf, and by the time you actually get up in flight and are eating it, it's probably two or three years old. It had a requirement that it had to stand 50 Gs of shock, you know, plus or minus 10 Gs of RMS vibration. It had to be, you know, stable at 180 degrees down to minus 50 or something like that. You know, it's basically a specification for a brick. <laughs> and that's what it takes. So, so, I mean, you, you know, this is not going down to get, you, you know, it's, it says spaghetti. <laughs> so does it come right. like, like, a, like a block? Like comes, comes in a bag, you know. <laughs> <laughs> comes in a bag like you get down at the, at, at the REI. Uh, you know, the difference is it's got a, a valve at the end of it, and you stick a, a water gun into it and squirt water in. Um, you know, to reconstitute it. Uh, but it's, it's freeze-dried food. Uh, okay, so we're going to get on to... Can, can you, yeah. because I know this is, this is one of your big claims to fame, can you talk about your EDA? Ha <laughs> ha, Lynn, come on! <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> Carrie, I was hoping to get into saving the world. Yeah, I, I'll let you save the world between four and seven. <laughs> <It's> just four. <more. laughs> Okay. Uh, what Lynn is referring to is um, uh, the EVA. You saw some, some of the pictures uh, from it. Um, first of all, I, I described uh, really, uh, if put yourself in the position that I was in on that third and fourth day, the third day where I activated the lunar module. I mean, I was a lunar module pilot. So I activated the lunar module, tested all the systems and that kind of stuff. And that's the day when putting a suit on early in the morning, I got sick, and then again in the mid-afternoon, um, which was a more interesting case. But in, in any event, and we canceled the EVA. All right, so the next day was when I was going to do the EVA. And you can imagine that laying there, laying there, you don't lay, but I mean floating there that the night before trying to get to sleep and not knowing 
you know, knowing as a minimum I had screwed up the EVA test and we needed to have an EVA uh, and use that backpack before we went to the moon. So probably that meant we're going to have to put one more flight in before we get to the moon. Uh, and maybe if I don't get better, we might end up having to cancel the rest of the mission. And so that's what I was, you know, unavoidably going over in my head. And I have no doubt Jim McGivitt and Dave Scott were, you know, as we all went to sleep that night before. So then the next day, you know, I told you the sequence, we get up there and of course, you know, I do the EVA. Uh, well, I, you know, it was scheduled for originally, I can't remember, two, two and a half hours or something like that. Um, and, you know, we had two and a half hours worth of activities during the EVA, but because the night before we weren't going to actually do the EVA and we hadn't been getting very much sleep, we had redone the schedule and got up an hour late because we, again, because we weren't going to do the EVA, so we, got to, we were going to schedule an extra hour of sleep. So by the time we got to the EVA, we were already, you know, we couldn't do the full EVA, but we decided to do just the daylight pass, so basically 47 minutes or so, 50 minutes. So I went out over the Pacific at sunrise. Um, and uh, we started uh, through the EVA process and about uh, after the first five minutes, uh, I was right at the point where I was going to go up the front of the lunar module and across the top and externally transfer to the command and service module. And that was a test that we wanted to do because we might have to do that the next day when we came in for the first docking of the Apollo series if we crumped the docking apparatus or couldn't get it out of the tunnel or something like that, you know, McDivitt and I had to get back into the command service module if we were going to get home. Uh, so we had a backup of going externally uh, across the outside of the spacecraft. So we wanted to demonstrate that that could be done without flailing all around, you know, going up and down the handrail and puncturing the suit on an antenna or something of that kind. So to document that, I mean, it wasn't much a question in our mind that it was going to work fine, but, you know, the engineering people always like to see you do something and uh, document it. So, uh, so McDivitt had a, or rather a Dave Scott over in the command module had a movie camera. He had that pointed at my traverse path, and I had just started up the uh, handrail when um, Dave said, hey, the camera jammed. And... Uh, McDivitt said, oop, okay, uh, Rusty, stop. Dave, you got five minutes to fix it. That's all we can afford, and Rusty, stay right there. So here I am on the handrail halfway up the... And you were tethered or not? Yeah, it's a tether, but not an umbilical. I mean, you know, they're all the life supports on your back, so it's, it's, it's just a thin string, really. Um, so I'm, I'm there, uh, you know, 90 degrees out from the front of the lunar module, and uh, Dave's going to take five minutes to try and fix the camera and McDivitt, I don't know what he was doing inside the lunar module, but I said, okay, I got five minutes here. Number one, Dave isn't going to get it fixed, <laughs> which he didn't. Uh, number two, I got five minutes where, you know, I'm not going to be uh, ha having to do things. And I said, in instead of thinking about, uh, you know, what was coming next and working through the checklist and all that kind of thing, I said, to hell with that. This is my chance of just really being here and appreciating where I am. And so I just let go with my right hand and just swung around, um, you know, holding onto the handrail with my left hand. And the sun is back over here, over sort of motion, over my shoulder, and the center of the earth was about there. So I mean, here's the whole horizon of the earth. I mean, just absolutely spectacular scene, right? And uh, so I'm just hanging there looking at that, and I'm saying, okay. <coughs> I'm not an astronaut, I'm a human being here, you know, let this come in. That, my job is to be a sponge. Um, but you got to understand the physical. I mean, the, the, the suit is very cumbersome, you know, the, you got the backpack on, the whole contraption, you know, not including you, weighs about 150 to 180 pounds. And the suit is, you know, 
it was a heck of a lot better than a Gemini suit, but you know, you're still doing a lot of work as you're moving around in the suit. Uh, you've got to bend the fingers and you know, you're inside a balloon and making it move. Uh, but if you're not moving, you're just floating inside the suit. The suit's floating and you're floating inside it and frankly, you don't even feel it. Because anytime you feel it, you're, it's pushing you a little, a little bit away from it. So you're, if you're just hanging there, not trying to do anything, you're just floating free. You don't feel anything around you. The backpack turned out to be surprisingly very, very quiet. Couldn't hear any fans or pumps or anything like that. And the radio, as long as nobody's talking, didn't even make a hiss. I mean, it's, it was a voice-operated radio, so. Dave was doing his thing. I, again, I don't know what McDivitt was doing. I was just hanging out, and nobody's making a sound, so there was no noise at all. And there's nothing you could see, because on that helmet, un unless I turned my head 90 degrees, I couldn't see anything other than just looking out through the visor. So it's like you're hanging out in space naked. I mean, man, that was, it was just great. Very comfortable. <laughs> Okay, and so I'm saying, okay, wow, this is pretty spectacular. So what Lynn is talking about is what happened uh, at, at that point, because basically I, I just said, okay, I you know, really appreciate this, and I'm thinking of the view and that sort of thing. But what happened was in my head come all these questions, you know, like, how the hell did you get here? You know, what, what, is, what does this mean that you're here? Uh, you know, how did I get here? I mean, obviously, this is not, uh, you know, the American taxpayer. This wasn't Saturn V that got me there. I mean, it wasn't even the American taxpayers. It's like, you know, this is, this is humanity reaching out into space. We're, we're starting to move off the planet. This is the beginning of that process. Uh, and, you know, what do you mean when you say you? How did you get here? Who am, who am I? I'm a kid from, you know, from a farm in New Jersey. Uh, you know, uh, any any of a million things that I did in my life, uh, including getting up late one morning or whatever. I mean, anything uh, changed, and you know, there's a whole ripple effect going forward in time. So I mean, there's, you know, it's obviously luck that you're here. Um, so, you know, what does it mean when I say I? Who am I? I'm not. Rusty Schweikert. I'm not just some individual. I'm not a little kid from New Jersey. I'm I'm sort of the leading edge of humanity moving out, you know, from the from planet Earth. Uh, now a lot of those thoughts I didn't have. The questions were there, but you know I wasn't thinking all that through. But you know over time, uh, as I got processing that whole experience, I mean that was what was clearly going on. Um, so I guess that takes us to. Astrobiology, huh? Yeah, just that, <laughs> or the, the the mental aspects of this, philosophical aspects of astrobiology. Um, I didn't get to the point of you know being a you know, late late version of panspermia or anything like that. But uh, uh, you know, it was pretty clear that uh, I was there representing all of you, all of life on the planet, because that's that's what's happening. This is. You know, later on I came to call the whole process that we're involved in, cosmic birth. And that, that's what historically is happening at this moment in time. Uh, you know, we're, we're pressing the limits of the planet, of Gaia, if you want. Um, you can look at what's going on out in the world there as contractions, including a little pulse of minus 400 on the Dow today. Um, you know, and uh, we're, we're pressing the limits of the planet. What happens when birth is going on is the fetus is pressing the limits of mom and the response is a series of contractions and a birthing process. And in a historic sense, that's what we're involved in. Uh, it'll have its ups and downs and, you know, that, that's a long way from the reality of arguing for the FY09 budget and uh, et cetera, which is all part of it. But that's standing back from it, what we're involved in. So um, we can pick up any other questions you have, but why don't we start 
just uh, want to say, now, now you can see why I wanted Rusty <laughs> to come here. And in fact, the first time I think we met was at an astrobiology meeting at the Carnegie. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're ideally suited to appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, the, the reason, the, the way I got into, oops, wrong thing, the way I got Thank you.